Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, apparently, uh, the way way thing is uh, I in I chair this session. Uh, this is uh, not that case, but um, I'm a former student of a speaker. <laughs> okay. So uh, so first of all, I would like to uh, introduce uh, David Hunter, uh, uh, the uh, current head of the city, to give an opening remark. Thanks, Vincent. So, uh, well, wow, suddenly it's a much bigger crowd than when I walked in here before. Welcome, welcome. This is the second time that we have done a marker lecture in statistical sciences. Uh, and, and these marker lectures, well, actually, I just want to call your attention to a whole bunch of useful information about these lectures and our speaker that's on the well-produced um, program that you see in front of you. And so before we go any farther, there's just a whole lot of people I wanted to thank. And fortunately, they've given you their names right on the program, right? So the folks on the organizing committee on the back here have done a great deal of work. Uh, special thanks to Kathy for helping to produce this program that you're holding. And, and Ling Zhou, who has just done an amazing amount of logistical work to, to make this all come together. So thank, thank you all very much. And thanks to the entire organizing committee that you see listed on the back of your program. And if you, if you open the, the, the program and, and look at the picture of Russell Marker, you'll learn a little bit about him. This is an emeritus professor of chemistry. And you'll, you'll see there that there are actually now seven different scientific endeavors that honor distinguished lecturers by, by inviting them to be Marker lecturers. Uh, it's roughly an annual event. And the statistical sciences that you see here listed as the seventh is the, the newest member of that club. And so, like I said, we have now, we're, we're, we're joining uh, together for the second Marker Lectures. And I guess without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask our speaker to come on up because we have a, a small token to present. Um, we should probably stand over here for something like this. So, the Russell E. Marker Lecture in the Statistical Sciences presented at the Pennsylvania State University today, October 5th, 2017, to Jen Ching Fan. I'll tell you a little bit more about dancing in a minute, but here's the, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That's right. You can, you can go back to your seat and put it, put it away. For just a minute. We, have, we have to talk about you a little bit more than that, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, so, so, so Jen Ching is actually more than, than simply Rinsa's advisor. Uh, not that that wouldn't be enough just as it is. But, but he is currently the Frederick Moore 18 professor of lots of things now, ready? Finance, statistics, operations research, and financial engineering at Princeton University. It's kind of interesting that it's the, the, the 18 professor, because we're heading up on 2018. I'm pretty sure that Frederick L. Moore was class of 1918 and not, not 2018. Um, anybody who has been around modern statistics uh, knows Jen Ching's name, knows Jen Ching's work. Uh, so he's, he's made seminal contributions in so many fields. That, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a brief smattering. So data science and machine learning, which we're going to hear a little bit more about soon. Finance and econometrics. Uh, he's the editor of, currently the editor of one of the flagship journals of econometrics. And he was pre uh, previously the, another, the, the editor of another journal. He's done all sorts of work in high dimensional statistics, uh, functional data analysis. He's well known for non-parametric time series. He's also done a lot of uh, non-parametric modeling. So, so the, the number of contributions that, that Jen Ching has made to, to our field is, is truly staggering. I mentioned that he is currently the editor of the Journal Econom of Econometrics, one of the flagship journals. Previously, he edited the Econometrical Journal. I was afraid I was going to mispronounce that. And uh, of course, he was also the co-editor, the editor, excuse me, of our flagship journal, one of our flagship journals in statistics, the Annals of Statistics. He has edited probability theory and related fields. Um, and, and among other things, I'm now told that you are the dean of the new college school of data science at Fudan University. Just in case you weren't busy enough, you're, you're now a dean in addition to all these other things. So, so as I said, we're, we're going to hear a little bit more about data science from Jen Ching in a moment, but, but I guess he's been in Shanghai helping them start up a data science program there. Uh, the, the awards that he has won to recognize his achievements are, are myriad. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, Academica Sinica has named him an academician, which is essentially the same thing as a fellow. 
He is the 2000 winner of the COPS President's Award. And uh, for those of you who may not know what that means, it's sort of our big award. It's, it, people sometimes describe it as the Fields Medal of Statistics. It's presented annually to one person under the age of 41 for, for outstanding contributions to statistics. He has also won the Guy Medal in Silver in 2014. Uh, there, I, I did a little count here. The, the number of Guy Medals in Silver that have been presented since 1893 are 88. Right? So it's a fairly select group of people. And basically, this recognizes a piece of work that was presented to the Royal Society uh, by a fellow of the Royal Society. And, and sometimes it also um, recognizes general contributions to the field. And, and if you go on the web and look for Guy Medal and Silver, you'll see that there are very many distinguished names in our field there as well. He is one of the winners of the first ever Pao Lu Xu Award in 2013. This is an award that's presented every three years to someone who, quote, makes influential and fundamental contributions to any field of statistics and probability. It's been awarded to a grand total of four people so far, and two of them have been marker lectures here at Penn State in the statistical <laughs> sciences, and your homework for today is to figure out who that other person is. Um, he has won other awards, the Morningside Gold Medal of Mathematics in 20, 2007, the Humboldt Research Award of Lifetime Achievement in 2006, he's a Guggenheim Fellow in 2009, um, and, and these are, are just the things that sort of pop up quickly when you either do a Google search or actually just look at the wonderfully produced program that Kathy has, has made available to all of you. So um, with that, I, I just want to say that I'm extremely excited about the talk that Jen Ching is about to give. I was t one hour ago, two hours ago, an hour and a half ago, listening to a talk on machine learning, a, a, a machine learning algorithm that has been applied at Penn State. And I just kept sitting there in the audience wondering whether there's been any thought about the statistical pitfalls that could be inherent, because I did not get the sense that the users were all that statistically uh, sophisticated. And lo and behold, here we are at 4.30, getting ready to hear Jen Xing tell us about challenges of analysis, excuse me, challenges on analysis of big data. And I wish I had heard your talk before I had a chance to hear this other one. So Jen Xing Fan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a nice introduction, David. So, um, yeah, I mean, I have known David for so many years, but not, I think not because of that, I got invited here. Uh, just, um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, that he was introduced so kind about myself. I was thinking maybe it's another person. So I'm so concentrated, I don't know it's my turn not to talk about something, right? So, uh, yeah, so just adding to, <laughs> to what David just said, right? So if you think that Princeton know and exploit enough, I'd be also put as a you know, professor of applied math and a professor of computer science, right? So it's all that says is a very simple thing. I'm a data scientist, right? So this is really <laughs> this is just all those summarize something like this. And so I'm, I'm aware there's a couple of people here either relate to Princeton, including David, or I mean at one time worked there. So uh, this is my home department, it's very familiar to people. This is Operation Research and Financial Engineering. So, uh, so really it's a name we call that way, but our foundation is probability, statistics, and, uh, uh, and uh, op uh, optimization. So at the end of it, it's really foundational data science. And then of course Financial Engineering at Princeton, you know, we all know that it had to be transparent. That was the design of the building, that's why we looks like that. And most of the building probably know that printing probably more looks like that than it looks like this. So it just know to emphasis a little bit on the humanity aspect or social science aspect of the department uh, of the university. So this will be my outline of uh, the outline of my talk. Right, so since it's a public lecture, so I'll give you know something that you already know, right? So rise of uh, big data. And then I'll be talk about uh, big data and society. So just to give you uh, uh, a little bit more insight, of what is big data for? Why is a big deal? And what's the relation with nowadays people call artificial intelligence? Really, the same old days. Uh, the same, right? I mean, uh, and uh, like, I mean, uh, and then of course um, these kind of things certainly have an impact on something that you and I are care about on the system and uh, and analysis. And in particular, I'll talk about a little bit more statistical, right? Because I'm a statistician here, so I'll talk about spheres, correlation, and Google Food Trend. Right? So we, well, I'll talk about you know how do we do you know 
robustness and high frequency trading just to do some of these. Right? And then lastly, I'll talk about dispute analysis and the, some privacy issues, and then I'll just summarize what I have said. So let me begin with the introduction. Right? So data tsunami. So information technology has revolutionized data collection process. Right? So millions of surveillance video cameras, billions of internet searches, social and the social media chats and tweets right? produce massive information that contain vital information about security, uh, public health, consumer preference, business sentiment, economic health, and many others. Right? So this useful data, how do we turn data into value? Right? So billions of prescriptions uh, and enormous amount of genetic genomic data uh, information provide us with a critical data really needed for uh, uh, for health and for precision precision medicine. And of course, in science, there are numerous experiments and observations in actual physics and geosciences. Right? So they give rise to big data in science. So certainly, if you uh, do Google food, uh, so Google uh, trend search, uh, big data. Right? So big data certainly uh, I mean, increased exponentially since 2011. Even as we speak now, it still I mean, you know, has a trend of increasing, at least not dying down. Right? So in terms of data size, I mean, we know that uh, there's a famous quote by Eric Schmidt, of, uh, CEO of Google in 2010. So they say, uh, it said there were five exabytes uh, of information created between the dawn of civilization through 2003. Uh, but that much of information is now created every two days. Right? So this emphasis on the speed and the volume of, uh, of the data. And then, of course, in terms of value of the data, so data are becoming the raw materials of business, right? So this data is saying about the value of the data. But of course, I mean, being as a statistician, right? I'm really quoting my our friend, right, Gary King's uh, uh, quote. Uh, so basically saying, uh, big data is not about the size of data. So I guess he must be man. You know, at the end of the day, is a decision we have to make, right? So we really need a small data. It's really the analysis that, uh, I mean, by the last part, the emphasis on the analysis aspect of the data. So, uh, so to me, I mean, these are all really talking about volume, value, and uh, the importance of the analysis. And nowadays, we all know that big data is everywhere, right? So from internet data, big data business, medicine, digital humanities, governments, uh, biological science, finance, and so on. Right? So, and because of that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, things, and then this, I mean, lot, I mean, the volume increased uh, extremely uh, fast. Right? So this basic five EB in space means that you can put more the data in five million PCs that you have. Right? I mean, a laptop, I mean, I mean, desktop PC, or I mean, uh, uh, that you uh, that you really uh, have. So it's increased uh, very fast. Right? So uh, and uh, the. I mean, the, uh, the value uh, that we extract from big data, it uh, cannot be, I mean, uh, cannot be reduced, right? So the characterization of big data is really, I mean, volume, variety, veracity, and uh, variability, right? So this, as you can see, the volume of data, how much uh, it increases uh, throughout the, uh, the year. And then actually, in, in term, not only that, but in terms of, um, Associated with big data, also accompanied with what's so called the uh, the dimensionality, it's always uh, getting very hard. So we'll get to that. Right? So um, so now, what is the big data and society? Right? So its impact on economics. So a report titled "Big Data: The Impact in 2012 at the Height and the Field the, the Big Data Search" is uh, in the World Economic Forum declared. Uh, uh, data as a new class of economic assets like uh, currency and gold. So the traditional uh, economic output is from traditional studies of economic book would be say labor plus the capital. And nowadays with the information age, everybody agree that uh, we should, I mean, use smart capital, use smart labor. So I think plus data is uh, really safe to say, uh, say that's what right? So, uh, so big data certainly provide data-driven industrial revolution to healthcare, scientific discovery, technological innovation, business management, and government policies. And certainly forever change the way of our work, uh, living, and uh, communications. 
So let me give you just a few uh, examples. So as a professor of finance, so every day we are doing uh, some kind of uh, prediction uh, too. Uh, and uh, so in addition to you know, the, uh, the data that we get, like uh, uh, stock, currency, derivative, commodity, microeconomic variable, and high frequent trades, so there are enormous amount of information uh, embedded in you know, unstructured news and text, right? consumer confidence, uh, business sentiment, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, economic health, uh, supply and demand in social media and internet. So the internet and social media contain a lot of all those information. And if we study asset pricing on the one, we all know that the, the price depending on conditional to the information up to now, uh, so you could price correctly what is the uh, what is the assets, and uh, with those, uh, I mean, and we always debate whether the market is efficient or inefficient, right? And you can see uh, with all those internet, certainly we make market all far more efficiency and a better place for all of us. So whenever we scan, uh, uh, whenever we check out from, I mean, uh, retail sales, right? So we, I mean, they scan our barcode, so certainly they provide, I mean vital information on public health, uh, economic health, consumer confidence, and uh, uh, preferences, and so on. So, uh, so here is just one of those, uh, simple example. Actually, I give a talk. I mean, when you were, you know, uh, I give a public talk in in Shanghai about, uh, you know, about uh, the microfinance. Right? So, I mean, the, I mean, we have talked so much on the secondary markets, and we forget about the primary uh, function of finance. Right? So it is really you not know, very simple. I mean, channel you, uh, investors' money into I mean workplaces, right? And uh, typically, that was being done before internet era, before big data, is that only those big investors has a chance to uh, I mean to channel money or invest money in the workplaces. And the small investor like me or small entrepreneur like others, not in this room. Uh, they have lots of ideas, but they cannot get funds needed. And one reason is the bottleneck, right? The cost of capital. I mean, how do I price? What is the risk involved? So how do I, uh, I mean, price of, uh, the risk of finance? And it's appropriate to talk on this <laughs> in the room of business school, right? So, uh, so the microfinance uh, idea is really just to channel small investors' money uh, into the uh, into I mean, small and small entrepreneur. And fueled by the big data and uh, through, I mean, the uh, internet. So financial technology enable us to, you know, to price, to give a very fair uh, value on, I mean, on each um, small investment of uh, uh, microfinance. And all these I'm talking is about uh, prediction, right? So this is important, and we know that prediction turn uh, the value of. Um, I mean, turn the value of uh, data I mean, into business, and I'll talk a little bit more on that. But there's also uh, plenty of, uh, of scientific studies that really need more than just prediction. Right? So you really need to know uh, causal relationships. So now I go to one of those subject areas, right? so like uh, uh, biological sciences. Right, like genomics, right? so we do like a disease classification, prediction clinical outcomes, or understanding biological processes and biological network using modern technology, or imaging technology like a microarray, uh, next generation sequence, or genomic data. So in this case, in addition that we want to predict well, uh, that it predict well, so therefore we create values, but also we want to understand right, the molecular, molecular process so therefore, we really want to know the causal relationship. And you can see the subtlety between these two. Right? So a lot of successful stories, yeah, like here, uh, let's say series, uh, or I mean, uh, let's say auto-completion when you do text or when you do Google search. Right? So all those are about prediction. And prediction is very understandable to everybody. Everybody understands uh, prediction. And they're creating a lot of values. And computer science is particularly good in doing that. Uh, and then, um, so, but there's a, also a lot of deeper that statistician working very hard, right, trying to understand causal relationship, trying to understand the, the subject. Right? So it decides what, which genes that actually, I mean, uh, that actually cause a particular kind of disease. So if I want, 
always through our good understanding of causal relationship, statistical inference, then we and we getting a possible I mean, understanding what is the therapeutic targets. Right? So imagine that if I miss two important genes, for prediction purposes, it will be replaced by many other genes whose linear combination behaves similar to like these two genes I missed. But for understanding biological process, for developing therapeutic uh, targets, if I miss these two genes, I completely miss the whole boat. The boat right? So you can never get a cure. Right? The same, right? so we got tons of data in genetics, like studying association between phenotype and, uh, uh, and the, uh, let's say, the snake or gene expression. And also, like the neurosciences, creating tens of tons of data that widely available for us. And we are not only want to understand uh, the prediction, but we also want to understand causal relationship, we understand what is the science behind that. And the statistician works so hard and so hard to be appreciated on understanding the more difficult aspect of analysis of uh, big data. So now talking about prediction, I spent, uh, I think, a summer ago or two summers ago uh, in one of uh, big company like, uh, like Google in the US in Baidu. So I spent one month there and uh, you know, just trying to understand what they are doing. So of course, they, all they are doing is to convert the value right, uh, of data uh, into uh, in for the society. So they really are doing a lot on application of uh, by do uh, location data. I spent there for one month. Uh, so they basically say each day they have one billion, uh, I mean location requests, and uh, they trace the users. Right? So really they understand who is who because I mean every time I. I use similar IPS or similar locations, so they were able to uh, trace in uh, two billion uh, users, and they each year they based on their I mean uh, map requesting data, and if you can combine the network in Shanghai, can combine the mobile data, you can do your location much uh, much better, and they use this to do uh, right I mean a so called smart city like uh, public safety and monitoring uh, and uh, uh, and so on. They use it to do business analytics. Right, starting from map, map query and locations, know that people like pizza and how, how far they have to go to get a pizza, right? And then finally, you know, they optimize the location, what is the business, you can, they can predict the, uh, the future uh, revenues. And then again, based on the, uh, I mean, Baidu trend uh, for searching of the, uh, let's say, interest in a particular stock, they were able to get in the momentum of stock, right? And then, uh, uh, like, the limit the, the universe of the stock so that they could uh, combine the traditional investment theory to get a better uh, results. And uh, interestingly, after we were talking about this, the, the bad news trend used to be over, just like people trend. They see the value of that, and they're taking these away. So there's no longer, it's accessible to me and to you, it's only accessible to Baidu. Right? So whenever they see some value, they took it uh, away, uh, and so on. So, um, so this just give you a few examples of how uh, big data re relate to our everyday life. I mean, from uh, scientific uh, I mean, inferences, to predictions, to converting uh, data into uh, I mean, into the uh, into the societal uh, values and making a decision uh, for us, and then of course they do similarly based on the uh, I mean the query that people made plus some kind of medical knowledge they're creating what so called internet uh, doctor uh, for that. So now let me talk a little bit on impact on the system and uh, uh, and the analysis. So uh, so big data certainly. <laughs> I mean, pose great challenges, right? No greater storage, communication, as right? so you cannot just communicate data from Shanghai all the way to New York, you know, uh, it's just too big and unsafe. And analysis, right? So, and it has changed many aspects of computer science, statistics, uh, computation and applied mathematics, right? So from hardware to software, uh, from storage uh, to uh, super, uh, uh, computing, and certainly from uh, the you know, database to data uh, securities, uh, from data communication to parallel computing, 
from uh, analysis to statistical inference and models, right? so data analysis. As I said before, Gary King said, right? I mean, big data is not about the size of data, right? <laughs> right? So uh, from scientific computing to uh, optimization, so surveys has a huge influence on all of us, right? And <coughs> the best way to describe all of us today here is to call ourselves uh, a data scientist, right? So I myself, as I said, is not an anything special. I'm really working just as a data science, so that, therefore, from this very point of view, I was an economic and finance professor uh, and financial engineering, but from you know, mathematical and then in our point of view, I'm a applied math professor, and uh, from machine learning, so from machine learning, I'm a computer science professor. So this is how we actually been uh, together, and all these kind of things cannot separate each other, and I feel I'm very lucky and happy uh, to be in you no know, part of uh, this, right? So the, I mean, all the efforts, right? So all the efforts that we try to solve uh, these kind of problems, I would call the uh, data science, right? So I think I basically say engulfed or surrounded by the applications. I think the application should be the primary, right? So then the fundamental core of data science, to me at least, it uh, consists of systems like a data acquisition, storage, and communication. And then, of course, uh, I mean, then data, big data analysis. Uh, a lot of these uh, relate to statistical data analysis, some of those even not relate to statistical data analysis. And then, whatever it is, a company with the, uh, with the uh, big data is always have this huge scientific computing in order to achieve this. So you will see there's some of very simple problem in precision medicine. I mean, I still cannot get in a very good uh, computing for this, right? So now, the next issue you naturally ask is, so what big data can do at the general or abstract level? So to me, I mean, good uh, big data hold great promises. For understanding, first of all, I would say heterogeneity for, let's say, precision medicine or services or precision uh, marketing or precision acts in general. So we basically, with large amount of data, we try to, uh, I mean, dissect population into many subpopulations. And each subpopulation requires different kind of services or, I mean, all, uh, all treatments. And, and uh, this is always done from, I mean, a very large pools of variables, factors, genes, environment, and their interactions. So, so you create a very, and there are lots of latent factors that you even do not observe, uh, that, uh, but that influence all the, uh, the outcomes. So, I mean, a very simple decision we want to make is given a disease, somebody are good for chemotherapy, somebody are very harmful to the chemotherapy. Right? So we really want, with big data, give us a chance to understand heterogeneity. So in the traditional case, if I see one very extreme case out of 1,000, you and I more likely than saying this is an outlier. We do not know whether science, a specific special group that we need a special treatment, or or is uh, or is just a random kind of error. Right? So with a million data, I see 1,000 cases. You know, I mean, there are some science behind that. Right? And then the other one is certainly commonality, right? So with the big data that we have so big, uh, so that uh, we could understand, you know, some of public health issues or some of the issues, uh, I mean, very weak signal, but you have very large uh, individual uh, variations or noises, right? So as a, as a French, people would say, well, you we drink wine per, uh, per night, or each, uh, a drink per night to help your heart. Right, as the Chinese always say, drinking tea does it help your uh, health? Right, so these kind of things usually you need to study. Uh, let's say uh, twenty years among half a million people. Right? So with big data, we could certainly, uh, I mean, uh, making these, uh, I mean, scale uh, much smaller and, and so. Now, big data always accompanied with uh, big dimensionality. Right? So, for example, if I just talk about five thousand genes. Uh, then the interaction of, I mean, of two two terms interaction of five thousand genes will already create uh, uh, twelve point five million uh, features or variables, right? And if you're talking about three term interaction, you'll get even way more than what I just present here. 
yet I mean synergy of two genes or three genes are necessary. I mean for I mean scientific uh, discoveries. So therefore, I mean we really deal with a huge uh, amount of uh, I mean a huge amount of variables that we are searching a lot of uh, amount of variable from those. And at the end of the day, of course. Um, uh, of course, it will have impact on our analysis, right? Uh, is your discovery real or, or I mean, our is discovery spirits? Because when you're finding something, you always find some patterns. And uh, and I mean, I'm lucky enough. I used, used to have a slide to show how I grow with with dimensionality. Right? So when I was uh, I mean teenager or early twenties, I was doing multivariate analysis. And uh, that um, that was based on three to five variables, right? Just traditional like a uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, multivariate analysis, and then come with revolution of digital data like a CD compact disc. So we are doing signal processing. So the dimensionality is still less than sample size. So in terms of non parametric model, maybe about you no, know, maybe about n to power. Uh, four fifth or, or, or whatever. Right? So then comes with microarray uh, technology and so on. Suddenly I have 20 microarray, tens of thousands of data. So dimensionality is much bigger than the sample size. That's why actually I started working with Vince and Lee, so we had a lot of fun uh, for doing work like that. Um, and uh, nowadays, I mean, of course, we deal with both big data. Uh, big dimensionality and a variety of data and a lot of measurements is uh, is pretty crude. Right? So so here I just summarize a few uh, I mean a little bit more concrete issues that I don't know how to solve this, but the, at least is a, a few problems that we could uh, unpack. Right? So when we talk about precision medicine or precision X, whatever precision marketing. Right? So what we have in mind is given very high dimensional uh, features or covariate as you have, right? you ask yourself, uh, what is the probability that first particular person belong to the first group? Right? So this is a probability. And knowing that person belong to that group, which subset of variables, which subset of genes that actually, uh, I mean, uh, and actually relate to the outcome, right? so that you can intervention, you can develop a therapeutic uh, target, and so on. And then given the last part, let's say, uh, given the same covariance, what is likely to come to the last class? Right? So is, this is really uh, a high dimensional unsupervised learning issues. And not only that, uh, that uh, uh, you also have features that influence you on, on these, uh, these variables. Right? So this is uh, this is a highly non-complex problem, so scientific computation of that is uh, is quite a challenge uh, to me. And then the second issue is that I'm talking, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on the uh, challenge of analysis. So whenever we get a lot of variables, so we always assume, well, there's a few genes, right, uh, tens or twenties, that relate to a particular outcome, a clinical outcome or disease. Uh, why? Uh, and then, and then we just simply assume that uh, uh, whatever part cannot be explained by those tens or twenty genes that we call epsilon, uncorrelated with tens of thousands or even millions of covariates. Right? So this is all your assumption. Can these assumption valid? I mean, to me, that's more than likely not valid because you just have uh, some. I mean the part of your response cannot be explained by a small group of variables. And you ask this to be uncorrelated with tens of thousands of variables you collected. This is a lot of assumption. So sparsity and endogeneity, I mean sparsity and exogeneity doesn't go each other uh, uh, together. So, uh, so we probably new, need a new paradigms of selecting important variables. So again, as I said, for prediction, it doesn't matter. But for the inference, it will be uh, impact very seriously. And then high dimensional data, I mean big data, we always measure using very crude device, right? So and some of those even different platforms. So we certainly have a lot of measurement errors. And when you have so many variables, right? So some of those variables got to be heavy tails. Is the method that we derive uh, work for this, right? 
And then when you do uh, what keep searching for correlation among tens of millions of variables, you'll find some correlation. And that correlation is really generally scientific there or just spurious, right? So how do we deal with the spurious correlation? Uh, and uh, how do we deal with noise accumulation in the prediction? So all of these really require, I mean, far more uh, sophisticated spiritual procedures, spiritual understanding, as well as scientific computing. And I feel I myself pretty lucky to be part of this, uh, this game, which I do not know how to do it, but uh, nevertheless it's very important. So let me give you a few examples, right? So on the Intel data analysis, so that we're not talking in abstract. So the first one, I'm talking about sphere correlation and fault discovery. Uh, and you'll see that can be quite uh, important. So, uh, so over the last two decades or so, so there are many exciting, I mean, data mining, the digital machine learning techniques have been developed, right? So example, and everybody knows that. So, uh, but now they everybody tend to agree that is a method that you can reduce the bias on that. So, and there are lots of development <coughs> done by Martin Way Rice Group uh, to prove that the result that, that Razor and I observe consistently uh, over and over again. And uh, so I introduce uh, to associate a set of covariates in uh, for a large a pool of, uh, of uh, for a very large pool. Now a natural question you ask is can this variable be spurious? Right? So this is a very natural question. So let me give you just a very simple example. This is by far not exhaustive. You can any example you see, I'm pretty sure you'll observe very similar one. So I just take. Uh, the data, right? Gene expression of 90 Asian, you could take Caucasian, you could take any other, result will be the same. For an uh, international head my project, so I have a sample size of 90, and they measure gene expressions for you know, different probes, so for simplest alcohol genes uh, in my uh, talk. And in particular, I just take one of those, right? So uh, they relate to uh, nicotine. Okay, at one point, I was smoker, uh, a smoker, so I no longer have one. But uh, so I just say, all oh, right. So let's let me take something related to nicotine. Right? And then so I have response gene expression of that particular one. And then I have all other probes or genes as my covariance, nearly fifty thousand of them. So you run, I mean, standard, let's say, uh, variable selection package. Uh, Lasso, if you like, you could also run deep learning. But of course, it would be it would be just doing prediction rather than, rather than uh, variable selection, right? So it selects twenty five out of nearly fifty thousand genes. Right? So now you calculate how good these twenty five does. Right? Calculate your Lasso fitted value with my observed data. Right? So this is in sample correlation between your fitted value and that. Correlation is nice, 0.9, Yahoo, big, right? So now if I want to be bigger, say, hey, let me just keep those 29 genes and run simple linear regression, that's a multiple linear regression uh, on the original data, it's taking this as, re as a response and these as a covariance. So of course, without shrinkage, you'll do better. Those, uh, uh, these, uh, the correlation will be uh, 92%. Now, with such a high value, I could still ask, is your discovery any better than chance? Right? And the reason is this, right? So choosing 25 from 47,000 of them is a lot of choices. And by chance alone, some of those choices would have a very big correlation, even though there's no relation whatsoever with that. Right? So this is the, the reference. If, certainly, we need, I need a reference distribution. That is, Suppose the data response was generated by a random number generator, and uh, and then I take so many covariates microarray uh, uh, to do that, and I run this, I mean software package, run the procedure I'm doing here. Uh, can I? How often can I get a correlation more than this amount? Right? So this this is actually is not really a, a fake story. I mean, there's always ambitious high school students near priest they want to do intern in the summer and I don't know what to do for them to do. Right? So I I randomly generate those outcomes and then give them microarrays, right? And teach them you know, so this is stepwise addition deletion and then so, so they learn those technologies. So at the end of the day they always associate something. 
And then they get into this high correlation. I tell them, unfortunately, my alcohol is a random number. It's not really <laughs> very general, right? So, so you can get the spirit. So, so in order to answer that, right, I need a reference distribution. Uh, and the reference distribution is like this, right? So when, just like what I just described to you, when X and Y are really independent, just a random number I generate to you, and then I choose, let's say, 25 variables, and whose best linear combination I want to predict Y. How good I can predict. Right? So this distribution is the reference distribution I use. If any discovery to be said impressive, you should at least higher than this, right? Because if you are not higher than chance, you are not going to be discovered. So in the example I just tell you a moment ago, uh, so if I choose 25 using lasso, this is the reference distribution. Because 25 from 50,000 is a lot of choices. So therefore, by chance alone, some discovery have very high correlation. And this is really the, I mean, the, the math and theory we derive, right? And in compare, 0.92 is not impressive at all in this, in this case, right? So if I'm less ambitious, I say I take a bigger penalty, so I only choose, uh, choose three uh, genes, right? So, I mean, 3 from 50,000 uh, uh, 50, is not uh, much less than 25 from 50,000. Right? So now I, I plot this, uh, this distribution, the reference distribution. Now, I mean, the discovery that you have here is pretty on the uh, top of the table, right? So now at least you could claim, I mean, to be uh, impressive. Right? So this is about uh, Spears' correlation. And then another thing I was going to say is, when now we go to the inference, right? Prediction, as I said, is easy, uh, but whenever we do scientific discipline, either economics or finance or, or biology or physics or psychology, right, so we really want to do, uh, I mean, we want to really do social inference. And we do inference based on, I mean, based on a lot of assumptions. So in the uh, lasso or scale that we were doing, we assume some kind of exogenarity. Remember, I say exogenarity, and sports, it doesn't go well. Right? Uh, uh, and uh, so at least, so this is your fitted value, right? so this is your fitted or selected variables. I compute the residuals, right? And if model assumption is reasonable, the correlation between these two should be very small. Right? So I have 50,000 of this. Right? So remember, I have 50,000 variables, and this is my fitted value. So I plot the distribution of, uh, uh, distribution of my 50,000 correlations with the residuals for each, each of these variables. And the overall dispersion is clearly seen. So if under null distribution, it should be looked like this, and what you see is like this. Right? So you really do need to apply any complicated statistical test. Just by using eyeball, you know that, uh, I mean, uh, the assumption that we made for valid inference of lasso and scale is validated. So we really need new paradigm, new ideas to, to do this, and then, uh, yeah, and then I have some idea, but never been able to compute well. <laughs> so it is, yeah. So uh, so I'm just saying that all these problems are there. So now let me just use say how Spears correlation uh, could lead to I mean wrong prediction too. Even though I said Spears correlation could lead lead to uh, I mean wrong prediction or bad uh, bad I mean bad sign bad inference, but it can also lead to uh, bad. Uh, uh, I mean, bad prediction. So this is the, I mean, Google flu trend. So it was very popular. I mean, launched in November 2008, and it used, I mean, the curiosity that people search, right? So the like Google flu trends, and trying to predict uh, uh, the uh, in the, uh, influenza like of illness of physician visit instead of uh, uh, ILI. And uh, so this is a very simple logistic regression. So logistic regression, the variable you put here, Q, uh, is really the top 45 uh, search items. I don't know what those top, top, top relate to, I mean, to the fruit. And then divide by the uh, entire world. So really, it's just a normalized, uh, I mean, public concern on those 45 terms, right? And uh, using this to predict the percentage of, uh, of uh, fruit. And the y is 45, and, and, and this is proprietary, certainly not new to me, and, and, and uh, uh, so that they only say 45, so this is the 40, and y is 45 because the correlation, uh, I think, are for 
uh, our sample uh, fitting is the uh, is the uh, uh, is the uh, the best, right? Uh, and then uh, as uh, and then they know that one thing that they know that if they increases more, let's say to 80 turns, correlation drop. I mean, very closely to this, right? They know the 81 turn is uh, related to all scout nomination. So at least they know that there are some terms, right? Happen to be search like all scout nomination spirit correlated with uh, in France at, uh, at that time. So they they take. Uh, top uh, uh, 35 uh, turns. So how does it uh, how does it work? When it was launched, I mean, predicted very well, right? So indeed, two or three weeks uh, ahead of traditional clinical uh, track systems. So of course, when you do that, it makes a big splash, right? So, uh, so the the group, I mean, is led by Dr. Brilliant, right? So very brilliant. Uh, first, I mean, <laughs> that, that really, right? So publishing the Nature uh, and, and and so on, right? Brilliant idea, certainly. Yeah. And then of course, New York Times uh, says that uh, well, I mean, well, it's uh, very promising result for having uh, I mean, comparisons. So the prediction are beautiful uh, and nice, and then many untold lives can be saved, right? And so. On. So now the I mean the first discrepancy starts to occur. So it's uh, so it's a big uh, I mean discrepancy between Google Full Track and the actual data uh, done by uh, uh, CDC. And this is uh, so this uh, this is the I think about H one and one or something. Uh, 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 the uh, the H one and one pandemic right, so off season so it was not pretty well. Of course, if something not pretty well, you know, engineer we could try right, to modify it. Right? So they delete some of those search terms. I don't know what they deleted. Uh, so search basically is also to reduce period correlation. Now prediction getting you know, pretty much better. Now until you know, some big discrepancy happen again. Right? So now I think they probably say it's time to quit. Right? So yeah. see, you see the photo of we touch and uh, something like that. Right? So this is just an example showing that, uh, oh, by the way, this is Sanko of Harvard's picture, right? so, uh, uh, so this basically, uh, I mean, uh, showing that, uh, right, I mean, spirit correlation can also make you doing spirits or worse uh, prediction too. Right? So this is just a simple example. Before I say spirit correlation can make you doing pretty bad uh, inference. So this is, uh, so it's important to understand spirit correlation. And the statistician predicted good. <laughs> in understanding this for four years, we were trained to do that, right? Now the next one, I'll just talk about prediction. Again, talk about simple principle can make you prediction uh, much better. So this is heavy tail distribution. It's really everywhere in terms of machine learning because most data was scanned or was done in, uh, in pretty primitive device, right? So uh, they are documented by all financial returns, macroeconomic time series, uh, high throughput like microwave called put young FMR, they all have, you know, have heavy tails. Now, when you have tens of thousands of variables or millions of variables, by like chance alone, right, some variable will have heavy tails. And this is pretty odd with you know, academic assumptions, say, well, tail are sub Gaussian, sub exponential, and so on. So this is pretty odd. And uh, uh, so here I'm just. Uh, I mean, do one simple example just to illustrate that. So how we can just simple solution, I mean, a more robust model will give you a much better uh, prediction. So in this particular case, I have 365 uh, signals. So it's really covariance, x variables. And we use this to predict uh, a target return uh, in the future. And the target return is really the smooth price from now to maybe next 15 seconds. Exactly how many seconds I got, I do not know because it's a proprietary thing, right? Uh, and then the signal is obtained from the historical data, basically. I don't know how they get all those sig uh, signals. And we are interested in out of sample uh, forecasting. Right? So this is the typical big data that you see. So for high frequency trading, just seeing about three months or four, uh, three months uh, data, four months data, about 21 trading days, 22 trading days per, per week. So it already has half a million or uh, observation or 1.8 gigabytes. So if you could imagine that I have 10 years or 1,000 stock, you're getting very big uh, data that more than what I can, uh, can do. And this is the target that you're predicting. You can't see very much. The only computer can do something. We cannot do very much. And among those 365 X variables or signals, uh, 
Uh, each individual marginal correlation is pretty small. It is only about when you square it, not for R square, it's about 1%. And this is, and, and this is the, uh, the life that we are uh, doing. So now if you truncate the data, both X and Y, truncate as certain data just to make it fit your uh, data more I mean, uh, in line with the targets, uh, and then as your truncation increases, right? So, uh, so let's say if I truncation equal to infinity, meaning you don't truncate data, right? so it's go back to all the least squares. So if, you, if I combine those 365 out of sample R squared, would be about 10% or so. So if you do truncation, as truncation uh, increases, you know that the optimal maybe in, in this particular data set is 1.78%, and this increase multiple R squared, by 0.4%. And in this highly competitive market, uh, yeah, I mean, this 0.4% is, I mean, a lot of data that you can, uh, you can make uh, money about. And of course, we try all those translation methods in other models, and you can see similar games. And then we have uh, similar predictions about uh, uh, truncation of using, I mean, predicting, let's say, bond risk premia, uh, I mean, using the uh, macroeconomic time series, this is 131 macroeconomic time series, this aggregated, plus those eight uh, aggregated uh, macroeconomic time series, such as, uh, let's say, GDP, right, CPI, right, uh, uh, and, uh, and others, like personal uh, consumption, and so on, and, and so forth. Right? So, uh, again, uh, if you if you do, I'm trying to predict the output, and again, if you do uh, robustness by just doing simple kind of truncation, a little bit better than truncation, so we extract the latent factors through principal component analysis from those 131 disaggregated microgram time series, and then just regress your output on uh, aggregate time series plus those, this, uh, plus those uh, eight uh, uh, I mean, extract time series. So this is really a principal component regression, a uh, principal component regression that I'm doing here. Uh, so at the end of the results, here is the, the baseline you can compare. Right? So again, the detail is not very important. If you're just doing ordinary one, so multiple R squared is only about 24%. And if you do truncate a more, more robust version using exact similar technique, multiple R squared jump to 37.9. Right? So if you predict three years maturity, from 21 to 32.6, and so on. So you can see that uh, if you have more robust model, you can really uh, predict uh, better. But now how can we do this for more complicated, like deep learning net and so on? Right? So it's uh, another issue. So the last part I want to talk is on the, uh, on the analysis, on the uh, impact of uh, I mean data analysis, right, on storage, communication, and privacy issues. So I have happened to write a few papers on this, so I just say a few words. Right? So, uh, so uh, computation challenge of big data, I mean, the certain processing power required to manipulate big data surpass that of standard computers, and we really need a new you know, paradigm of optimization computation statistics. Right? So, and then very often nowadays data being in script, right? so we really have difficult to, you know, like traditional statistics, you cannot just turn data many times because every time requires a lot of time to read all those, uh, all, all those data. And uh, one of those uh, popular studies, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean network or I mean computation architecture is, is this, right? So you have, let's say, many nodes and machines, and then you have a central server. Uh, and we all know that the communication is very expensive, right? so uh, we do not try to uh, communicate everything to the central server, so, we do, so Google do not send all the data I mean, to the uh, central server, so everybody know the machine keep their own, uh, own data. So this way, of course, help solve storage issues because data are disputed, right? help uh, computation issues because each node machine can do computation, have communication issues because I'm only asking uh, each machine to communicate certain kind of computational results in order to communicate the whole data set, only very partially. And the most importantly for me, uh, I mean, that relate to, I mean, one of the hard to solve is uh, privacy and ownership issues, right? So if you ask individual to send in data to, uh, to this node machine, 
people would be very concerned. Uh, so if I, I ask you just to participate by sending, you know, uh, let's say, an access results, I mean, people would be, uh, would certainly be less concerned. Right? So they would really help solve uh, privacy or ownership issues. Right? So this kind of architecture is a non-invasive way of dealing with uh, big data. Now, the question arises as that issue. Right? So you do not own all the data. Can you really get in a uh, very similar result as if you own the uh, own all the data, right? So can you? I mean, can you do so? so uh, I mean, uh, this build inference with the strong social guarantee that you could work as if you own all the data, and uh, just like most of those mega studies. So one key word I want to say is this. Right? So whenever you have noise, noise can be averaged away, can be reduced by law or large number by doing average. Whenever you have bias. Right? So bias cannot be uh, bias cannot be uh, average away. So when you have a, sm uh, a smaller sample size here, the bias tend to be larger. So therefore, if you begin with the bias estimator, at the end of the day, you'll get the, the same bias that you begin with, right? So so here I'm using one example is on high-dimensional uh, distributed uh, estimation and inference, which is being accepted by analysts of statistics. So I did not go into any detail of this. But based on concern about uh, sparse learning and the feature selection using uh, using lasso, so I have data distributed on k different machines. So each of those certainly can run lasso itself. And then before you send into the central server, the most important and fundamental issue is you need to do debiasing because otherwise bias would be big at the central server. Right? So you do debiasing. Now that you go to the central server, central server aggregate all of your information, get creating a, a kind of aggregation, let's say average, and now you, uh, you truncate or uh, selecting the variable over there, and then if needed, you communicate further, asking each machine just to you know, run, let's say if I select 20 variables, ask each machine just to least square based on 20 variables, so I have no, no bias anymore, and now you aggregate at the end of the day, and we basically were able to show that uh, even though I never hold, I mean, I never own the whole data sets, my social error is this big, uh, let's say this is the fundamental limits uh, by, let's say, statistical or uh, information limits, so you can never go beyond that limit. And now if you do just this good inference, as I said before, the error here is much smaller than error here, so therefore for error to here is negligible. So this is really uh, basically showing that uh, if you do debiasing early enough, uh, I mean, even though you put down only the whole data sets, you are able to do as well as if you own the whole data set. So this shows us, I mean, just one example, right? So it's possible to do this field inference with this whole guarantee and uh, an architect like this uh, can help you solve a lot of issues. And of course, there are more complicated ones than that. I mean, just, uh, I mean there are more issues than that. Just uh, one example to show you, uh, because of the data, we really need uh, some kind of big and, uh, and uh, uh, innovative uh, solution. So let me, uh, this is the same as distributed PCA. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, since I'm going to talk tomorrow, so I'll just, I mean, just maybe uh, skip uh, this. Uh, about uh, dispute uh, PCA. So let me just conclude. So what did I say? <laughs> so I basically say big data hold great promise to for the discovery of heterogeneity uh, and the search for personalized treatment and precision marketing. Right. So it allowed us to find uh, weak patterns in presence of large individual variations. Right? So it provides new resources for economics new evidence for scientific research, new information for decision and uh, policy making. Right? And uh, of course, as data scientists ourselves, uh, there's lots of opportunity for us. Right? So it's put great challenges on storage, communication, and uh, analysis. Uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs>
approach? That is, is it generally uh, straightforward to include heavy tail errors in procedures, or, or, or is it too difficult? Uh, right, so uh, you asked a very good question. So, uh, as I said, most of academic work today is based on the assumption that uh, no data are sub Gaussian or sub exponential. And then I think we wrote uh, a paper on uh, the title even called Principle of Robustification. So, we basically give two different kinds of principles. One is that you look at uh, truncate on the data. Uh, for some problems, okay, on the data, it's easier, and this is an example, one that I show you when I do a high frequency financial prediction. And the other one is you can truncate on the loss, that would be called Huber loss. And we did not use the name called Huber loss, we called adaptive Huber loss, because Huber loss is, was always used to deal with maybe robustness, uh, again, like symmetric error distributions. Because now, when my estimation called as matrix, so the distribution cannot be symmetric because any square random variable cannot be uh, symmetric. So, uh, so therefore, I need to uh, yeah, I need to let truncation there to reduce the bias. But on the other hand, it doesn't rely too much on the tail. So there's a trade-off between robustness and tail, uh, and there's a general principle on that. So if you are interested, I could point some reference for you. Yeah. Mm, very good question. Actually, uh, being, you know, I mean, I was introduced as a dean, I would rather say as an honorary director, right? So, so, uh, so in Shanghai, so certainly, uh, I mean, we got a lot of like, uh, uh, I mean, I know that there are two markets, uh, at least in China, I know very well, one is in Shanghai. And the other is in uh, in uh, uh, Fuyang. So there are I mean, at least two places people trade uh, data. How that can be done? I mean, there's uh, maybe I don't know. There's some blockchain technology that you can probably use. That because it's privacy and, and all those issues uh, is concerned. So this they 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 really started to have some kind of. Uh, uh, I mean, exchange markets there, and uh, we do. You and some of my colleagues will do collaboration with them to design those mechanisms uh, to ensure that data only being used for the intended purposes rather than beyond. Right? So there's a lot of uh, complication there, but the, uh, the trading uh, of data is already <laughs> beginning. And in, in, in a sense, right? So when we put I mean, buy data from Bloomberg, right? It's a, it's a kind of trading. I don't sell, I cannot resell data to another person, but it's a kind of you know, like trading already for there. Thank you. Oh, okay, so sure. I mean, this is a very good question. Right? So, uh, I mean, you know, you know, Chinese is always a Google scale, right? So, so I mean, I mean, in five years they want to get the fifty faculty, right? So, uh, so starting from zero, uh, so we already have uh, operate like they already have operate like for about eighteen months. So we have right on the target, we have already fifteen people there. So and uh, so certainly we have ten more position like uh, in Princeton to get two positions is very hard. Right? We have ten more position there and certainly welcome anybody who wishes to apply. And that doesn't limit to uh, statistics, right? Whether they apply math, uh, computer scientists. So it's all those kind of people is really it's the broader view of data science is uh, uh, is there. And then uh, and in addition we. I think we established like a nine day, I should say we, I should say they, I mean, I mean uh, they established like a nine to ten uh, institute already, interdisciplinary institute to, uh, to forge the collaboration uh, between academia and the subject disciplines. The answer, quick answer is yes, welcome, and <laughs> please do apply. <laughs> Yeah. So to, to follow up on that, so where is the leadership coming from? The computer science side, from the database, from statistics, and the well, uh, data science uh, Yeah, so yeah, this is a very, I mean, a very good question, right? So I 
think uh, I mean, everybody has a place to play. Right? So at Princeton, so when we create a uh, study of machine learning, now they call more like data science. So original vision was, I mean, co-directed by the uh, by the machine learning person and statistic person at the time. Uh, intended to be like the Robert Shapiro and myself, uh, uh, and there's a Robert left. Uh, so um, yeah. So to me, it seems to me is really a field. Right? So everybody has something to contrib contribute, and uh, I can easily see the advantage and vision, the differences, slight differences between these two uh, groups. But uh, but uh, I think uh, I think whoever the leader. Right, so I think you should have a broader vision, uh, and a broader vision, uh, understand that the data science is really multidisciplinary. Just like the same way that I've been hired by so many departments at Princeton, so there's only one character I can say is a data scientist, but otherwise, you know, um, it's hard to include others. I don't know, what's your take? <laughs> I agree, there, there are at least three areas that we yeah. have to participate. Right, exactly. And then in like uh, in like Fudanki was mentioned, we really have all those computer scientists, statisticians, uh, applied mathematicians, and these are as a core. And then of course there are people that are doing big data image. Right? So it neither belong to uh, to computer science nor belong to statistics. Right? But these are they are all existing very well in one uh, in one uh, in one I mean uh, umbrella of data science. I'll ask a more statistical question. So, uh, when you distributed lasso setting, you, you went back to the users to mm -hmm. get some sort of unbiased mm -hmm. estimate. But I guess I'm just sort of wondering, did you ever really need the initial estimates from the users? Because in the end, you sort of go back and say, I want these guys to just estimate them. I'm just sort of wondering, how much is going to be from those? Well, the initial users? So, because you have these initial estimates you get, right. and then you try and you need them to be biased, right. Right. and then you compile them, <laughs> and then you use that to select, and then you go back oh, and say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, right, 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 yeah, yeah, so, so the, yeah, when I write it this way, yeah, I mean, I did really basically say that if, when, if you want to communicate, right, so you should communicate a debiased estimation, so the initial problem not as important, it's really just a debiased estimation, but debiased estimation, Usually refer to which one we are using. Right? That's why I started from initial estimating, uh, followed by the bias uh, uh, estimation. So the so as long as you could construct less bias estimator, it's always good. So it's no harm in the variable selection case. You are under smooth. You can do right shooting smaller lambda under smooth and then communicate. Probably it's no harm that you communicate from uh, a serious bias estimator to begin. I guess, what I, I guess what I was wondering is, in the end, if I understand correctly, you said that you were having to do these squares last step. Uh, right. At the very last step. At the very last step, so I the did. last step, yeah. you're communicating right. selection of predictors, you're not communicating a final estimate, right? And then right. Was, yeah. so, so I'm just sort of wondering. If, uh, yeah. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, I, I'm at very initial stage. I do not know which variables right, would be useful for me. So I ask each machine to send that information. I aggregate them. So now I learn which one are variables. So now I ask everybody, hey, just do, I mean, do these variables that I want. So everybody now send me quote unquote unbiased estimator, and now I aggregate them together. So I need this whole process in order to get that. Because otherwise, I do not know the identity of those, uh, I mean, procedure that I mean, uh, I mean variables that you want. <coughs> 